This week, we're working with network protocols. Now, last year, I made a couple of videos on the OSI model and TCP IP model. So this year, I want to focus on Wireshark and how we can interact with these network models and with the protocols using Wireshark. So first of all, we have the OSI model, which is the theoretical model of networking that divides networking into layers, and there's seven layers. And then we have the TCP IP model that has corresponding layers that correspond to the OSI model, but it's four layers. And the TCP IP internet suite of protocols is the model of the internet. So we have all of these protocols, which are part of the internet protocol suite, and then and they're used um, every day over the, when we communicate over networks. And they relate to the TCP IP model and the OSI model because they're layered, they, they work in layers. Now we can experience this when we start to look at packets using Wireshark. If we, if we tap the network and we capture packets or basically frames going across the network, we can take a look at these protocols and see these layers in work at work. So if you see here, we talk about encapsulation when we send when we send data over the network, that data that we want to send, whether it's an email or a web page or a request for a web page, that data gets broken up into pieces called segments and they are added on with a transport layer header. So the data gets a transport letter layer header uh, transport layer header which has important control information in there. Um, that tells us about the types of data that we're dealing with, the type of applications that we're dealing with. Then at the internet layer or the network layer, uh, the segments, the individual segments are given a network layer header with network addressing information and network control information. So that data is wrapped with a transport layer header and then it's wrapped with a network layer header and then it's also put into a frame. And so in the frame, we get the frame header and the frame trailer, which encompasses the network header, transport layer header, and data. And the frame header has MAC addressing information or uh, network access layer or frame layer addressing information, which is oftentimes um, ethernet uh, addressing information. And then the whole thing is turned into ones and zeros and sent over the network. And when it arrives at its destination, it's put back together again. And so this is what we have. So when we send uh, data across the network, it's sent in frames. Uh, and those frames have frame headers and inside is network header and inside is transport layer header. And these are in pieces. And then the pieces are put back together into data. So if we want to take a look at this information, we can use a program like Wireshark. If you go to wireshark.org and download and install Wireshark, then we can capture these frames or these packets to use the term packets kind of loosely there. And when you're installing Wireshark, you're going to want to install the necessary libraries and drivers that make it work. So if you're on Windows, you want to install the NPCAP libraries which replaces the WinPCAP libraries. You might want to also install the USB PCAP libraries if you want to do packet capture over your USB ports. And then um, if you're running Linux or Mac OS, you're basically using libpcap, which is a Unix-based library that's used with TCP dump, which is another form. So then uh, you install Wireshark and it looks like this. Now, when you run Wireshark, you need administrative privileges to have Wireshark access your network interface. And so in this case, you see I have my capture interfaces here, and I'm going to be wanting to wanting Wireshark to hook into my Wi-Fi or my wireless NIC, my wireless network interface card. So you have to run the program with administrative privileges. So if you're Windows, you can just run the program and grant it administrative privileges. If you're in Linux, you can run Wireshark with a sudo, super user do command in front of it to get admin privileges. And in Apple, you could also run it from the terminal, launch it from the terminal using sudo, and then put the path to Wireshark. Or you can try to put a more permanent solution by um, using the DS edit group or and then activating the um, the Chmod BPF uh, Berkeley packet filter uh, library. In 
Wireshark, if you open up the help um, contents, you'll see the Wireshark user guide and it'll talk about building and installing Wireshark for the Mac OS. Another thing you can do that one of my students did recently was write a little Apple script to so that when you launch Wireshark, it launches automatically with the administrative or root privileges that you need to have access to it. Okay, so let's start using Wireshark. I've already installed Wireshark and I'm ready to use it. Okay, so I've launched Wireshark. I'm running the program. So there's two ways we could do this. We can work from a live capture or we could open up a packet capture that's already been saved into a file and then look at all those packets that have been saved into that file. So we could either do a live capture or we could open a packet capture file or network trace file. So in this case, we're gonna do a live capture. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna choose my Wi-Fi interface and I'm just gonna double click on this Wi-Fi interface to start capturing packets. So right now I'm capturing, you can see here, uh, we have some information here and the capture is going. I can stop the capture here by pressing the stop button and then I could restart the capture by pressing the little shark icon here and it'll ask me, do I wanna save the packets? No, I wanna continue without saving. So I'm gonna start capturing and I'm gonna open up Google Chrome and I'm gonna to go to a website to generate some packets. So I'll go to, we'll go to this website. So that should generate some packets. And we can see here, if we go back to Wireshark, you can see here that we're generating some packets. And then I'm gonna to go to a couple other places. And then I'm going to go to, I'm gonna use FTP. So I'm gonna FTP to generate a different type of application or a different, a different protocol. And I'm gonna FTP to dalbergetti.com here. And then I'll have to put in a username and password. Okay, I'll put in the username, which is student at, and then the domain name, and then I'll paste in my password and I'll sign in. And this should FTP me into my web host. And you can see there I am. So I'm in, I see the index, and then there's a file in here, and then I'll, I'll click on this file, which should download the file. And there it goes. I'll close out of the FTP connection. I'll close my web page, and we'll do one other thing. I'll open up Putty, and I'll use Telnet, and I'll use the uh, Telnet protocol, and I'll Telnet into towel.blinkinlights.nl and we'll see if we can telnet into this server. So we'll open that up. And sure enough, I, I knew this telnet server was available. It's got an ASCII animation on it. Um, and it's uh, Star Wars in ASCII. It's kind of a, a well-known, it's been around for a long time. And, um, but it's cool because it uses telnet. So I've got a telnet connection. And there you can see 20th century text. And a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So here comes... Star Wars in ASCII. And it's just a little ASCII animation, it's pretty fun. So we're capturing this, all of this right now is being captured in Wireshark. So I've got this big capture going on. So I'll capture for a little while longer till we get to see a few, a few more frames here, a few more pages of this ASCII animation. And then I'll stop the capture and then I'll even save the file so that I could use it later in my class with my students. Okay, so there we go. And here comes the ship and we have the animation. And okay, looking good. So I'll stop this. Yep, there's R2D2 and C3PO. So I'll exit out of here. And then that closes the connection and then I will stop my capture. Okay. So now what I can do is, is I can do file, save as, and I'll save it as a PCAP NG file. As Dan's PCAP and save. So we have that to work with. Okay, so now that we have all these packets saved, we can look here and say, well, what do we have here? 
what does what shows up in our packet capture well i can see right off the bat here there's the first packet right there and then all the way down here the last packet 5935 packets now the way wireshark works is you have three basic windows to work from well first of all you have your menu bar up here then you have the this is the packet list window and we say packets these are actually all separate frames but we use the term uh, packet colloquially here to just represent basically each one of these frames and why frames why do i mean frame i mean because the packets actually wrapped in the frame and so it's at these are actually all separate frames so um, this is the packet list window up here and then in the middle is the packet details window which you can click and drag and so this is the packet details window and then down here is the packet binary window or let's see here um, view the packet bytes window excuse me the packet bytes window and this bytes window can be shown here in um, hexadecimal or it can also be shown as bits so there it is as bits and it can also be shown as bytes in hexadecimal so we've got kind of like the raw bytes here we have the details here and then we have a list of all the packets up here now one thing we can do is when we're looking at Wireshark it looks pretty intimidating you're like oh my goodness what is this it's actually pretty simple um, these are the individual frames and this is all of that header information the addressing if you will that helps uh, send traffic over the internet from a source to a destination from the beginning to the end so we have the the source IP address the destination IP address but we have a lot of other information in here as well now one thing that we can do to work on this is we can make some changes to the interface interface Wireshark is extremely configurable and we can decide what we want to see and what we don't want to see we can create uh, new columns we can create separate profiles to we can create buttons for filtering there's all kinds of stuff we can do so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to edit preferences and I'm going to work on some preferences here or, or just show you some things that we can do one thing we can do is with name resolution I could say resolve network IP addresses and you can see here all the IP addresses here watch what happens when I click resolve network IP addresses and click OK now instead of um, just the IP address you can actually see the domain name of the host or the name of the host that's doing um, the resolving so at this IP address it was opendns.com this wasn't my DNS server it, it was uh, the it's the no longer the IP address of the DNS server but the actual server host name or um, let's see here you can see here now it says instead of Google's IP address it actually shows www.google.com the, the server so this is the 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 server that we were talking to not the IP address now if I go back in there and I turn that off I'll go back to preferences and go to name resolution and turn off the resolve network IP addresses and click OK then it returns to just the IP address it's no longer says that it's Google it just says just shows the IP address so that could be something that's useful to you the other thing that we could do is work with our timestamps so let's see about uh, saving the time view time display format and you can see here that right now in the time display format the seconds which we can see here are the seconds from the beginning of the capture so you can see here from the beginning of the capture the time is 000, zero and then the next uh, packet the next packet and we so our time is relative to the capture but what if we wanted to know the exact time of day that this happened what if we were examining uh, packet capture or network trace because there was um, you know something going on in the network and we want to know what time of day this was happening on the network well we this timestamp is not very useful so we could change this to the time of day so let's do that so we'll say edit no I'm sorry view and we'll say time display format and we could say date and time of the day right uh, date and time of day or just time of day here and uh, we'll say date and 
time of day. So now it has that this packet capture, this packet was at September 30th at this time. And so now not only do we have the numbers of the packets, but we have the exact time and day that this was occurring. So there's a lot of things that we can look at. So in the next video, we'll take this packet capture that we have here and we'll isolate different protocols and we'll look at the different protocols and we'll get into some of the details of what's happening here. In other words, I can use a display filter here and say, just show me the HTTP packets. And there's the HTTP packets from the couple of web pages that we went to. Or I could say, show me just the FTP information. So here's the FTP packets. And you can see here where we logged in. And it may, depending on whether we used secure FTP or not secure FTP, may show the password, might reveal the password or something like that. So that's interesting. Um, you can see the username right here, student at dlbrigetti.com. And we can also examine the Telnet traffic that we generated when we used the Telnet protocol. So there's the Telnet, and you can see here we could scroll through all the Telnet packets. We'll go to one of the last packets here, the data, and open up the Telnet here and scroll through. And there is the picture, uh, the ASCII text art that was sent across in this packet or this frame. And there it is. There's the 